So good morning, brothers and sisters. As we come to this last meeting of this week, we're going to examine an article that has been posted on the internet. This will be the first of a few that we will look at to see if we can agree or disagree based upon the items and subjects that we've been studying over these last couple of years. So before we get into this article, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the night's rest that is be behind us. We thank you for the day that is before us. We ask, Father, for your guidance in all that we are to do. Help us now, Father, to listen and understand, to see that which we need to rightly divide in the word of truth, so that we may come to a clearer understanding of that which you are saying to us at this time. Please be with Theodore as he is on his hike. Help us each now to look to understand that which will be before us. Direct our thoughts and our actions through this day. Thank you, Father, for these blessings. Guide us now. For this, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, before you is an article that has been posted on the Internet. It is part of 12 articles that have so far been presented by this author. This author uses a premise that Miller's rules can only be properly understood and applied only if, it, if they are used with the King James Bible. The second part of his premise is that the daily that has been presented is understood to be a godly power by the majority of Adventists, where, as we have studied, the daily is not a godly power. Now, the reason I've gone to part eight of their study is this premise that he's using that the daily and the king of verse 36 have some connection. The purpose of these portions are really to test our understanding of what we see and to determine would we agree or disagree what this author is presenting. Now, as he starts in this page, Within the context of our proposal, there are three separate arguments that can be made in order to establish the identity of the king of verse 36. Now, when we are looking at this, verse 36 would be Daniel 1136. So to understand what he is saying, Daniel 1136 reads as follows from the King James. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Now, if I was to segue to a portion of his premise, if I was to look at, at, the, at Young's literal translation, it would state, and the king hath done according to his will, and exalted himself, and magnifieth himself against every god, and against the god of gods, he speaketh wonderful things, and hath prospered till the indignation hath been completed, for that which is determined hath been done. The reading there is just a little different. Now, this author continues, the one is by the use of Miller's rules, another is by the use of the daily as paganism. So he's speaking that there are three separate arguments that can be made to establish this king. One, using Miller's rules, another by the use of paganism. And here the statement is made, the third argument is found in confirmation of these two by the spirit of prophecy. So, if we are looking and we are studying our Bibles using Miller's rules, are we necessarily 
going to have a disagreement with anything that's presented within the spirit of prophecy. What would you think? What would you say? I would uh, favor uh, agreeing with the, the spirit of prophecy. Okay. So as the title of this, art, of this article implies, we are going to start looking at the daily. Now, was the disagreement over the daily something that was faced in the Millerite time? Well, they were pretty agreed. The Millerites were agreed, yes. Were the Protestants in agreement? No, they were looking at us as uh, a daily sacrifice in the temple in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Right. So this next paragraph reads, as we have already seen, most people in Adventism, especially our scholars and the Biblical Research Institute, subscribe to the new view of the daily, where the new view is held to be a godly power. To argue against the old view of the daily, as outlined in our proposal, is to miss the entire point of these articles. Remembering that the point is not an attempt to convince anyone to change their minds of study, their method of study, sorry, but instead to show that a given set of interpretive principles will produce their own unique conclusion. In other words, each method of study will produce its inevitable conclusion that is unique to that particular peer method. In this case, it is the use of Miller's rules as opposed to the historical grammatical or higher critical methods of Bible interpretation that will bring us to it, its own unique conclusion. This principle also applies to the other aspects of our proposal. And in the end, it is up to each individual who reads this to decide, based upon the weight of evidence, whether these things hold true or not. Now, this next segment, <coughs> It's been entitled The Law of Genetics. As we begin the actual study of Daniel eleven thirty one 31 to 45, we are not going to attempt to go into the minutia of every position that is set forth. The understanding, for instance, that the daily represents paganism automatically brings its own set of presuppositions. Paganism does not just apply to the daily in the simple sense that daily equals paganism, but as such, it also stands in its place as the fourth kingdom, that of pagan Rome. This is shown in the succession of kingdoms in Daniel 2. Now, am I missing something here? Because I thought that the understanding that we have found in our study is that the daily is paganism, which then gives way to the abomination that maketh desolate. So in, in where the author is saying that paganism does not just apply to the daily in the sense that daily equals paganism, he's expanding to say that this stands in the place of the fourth kingdom. Would we agree with that? Well, we've the considered paganism, paganism I'm sorry. Go as ahead. part of the... Uh, okay. Well, paganism uh, is connected at, um, that was previous to the, uh, basically the papacy comes in and then, as you say, abomination and desolation. But it, pa pa um, paganism is part of pagan Rome. But there's pagan Greece, there's pagan uh, Persia, there's pagan Babylon. Um, so we've connected the beginning of 723 as a, as a structure where you have uh, paganism and uh, persecution persecuting those people in a, in a different manner and it takes over northern Israel and then you have King Manasseh taken to Babylon um, 46 years later so what's he he's saying that paganism is or the ending in pagan Rome. Is that what he's saying? I, it would seem to be that way, yes. So maybe like in 168 or whatever, 31 BC, whatever, so maybe around that time, you start seeing the, the daily ending. Well, we seem to have here an entrance 
that is not firmly establishing that Rome establishes the vision. Now, that's a that's a premise that I came to understand a long time ago. Do we all agree that Rome establishes the vision for everything that we're seeing within this book of Daniel? Yes. Okay. Well, well see, just apply maybe just going back to what I'm looking at what he's saying there. He's saying it stands in the place as the fourth kingdom. So he's maybe just saying Rome is the daily, is paganism. Okay. So pagan Rome, or as as we're saying right now, paganism in its many forms, whether it is Babylonian, Media Persian, Greek, or Roman, that paganism is the equivalent of the daily. And if we're accepting what the pioneers had had been looking at, especially what Hiram Edson had looked at, then the abomination which maketh desolate would be papalism. Now, there was one other brother that had a comment. Have we have we addressed what you were going to ask or is there something that you that you would like to point out or question? Okay. This next paragraph, each of the kingdoms of Daniel 2 successively held the title of paganism, but they terminate in pagan Rome, and their characteristics are then transmitted to papal Rome. This is seen in the beast of Revelation 13, 2. Papal Rome is but the inheritor of the principle found in Exodus 20, verse 5. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. This system, Papal Rome, has inherited the iniquities of its fathers, the pride of Babylon, the infallibility of Medo Persia, the false education of Greece, and the legalism of pagan Rome. Would we have any problem with this statement? Is there anything that we would add to this, or is there anything that that should not be there. Next paragraph. The characteristics of these kingdoms are simply the outworking on a larger scale of the elements that reside within the fallen human being. These four kingdoms represent the perfection of a system based upon fallen human nature that is expressed by paganism. It is interesting to note that it is pagan Rome in particular that is set apart as diverse from the other three kingdoms and described as dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. To view this power from a military standpoint only is to lose the perspective of its true ability to persecute God's people. This power devours the whole world, but is specifically directed toward God's people. It does this with its iron teeth and brass nails which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Iron stands for Rome, and brass stands for Greece, the leading characteristics of which are legalism and false education. Any thought to that? That's the first time I heard anybody uh, mention the nails as Greece. You know, any authors, anything. I mean, I've, I've realized that before, you know. But he's the first one that actually mentions that. <laughs> okay. From what I've been reading stuff. All right. That's a good point. Okay. In other words, it brings a system of legalism and false education to bear against God's people in particular, but also against the world. It explains how the host, God's people of Daniel 8, 13, are trodden underfoot. And it explains how the dragon, in the form of pagan Rome, stood up against the woman, the church, to devour her child, Christ, from Revelation 12.4. Now, in that situation, Revelation 12.4 reads, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. It also explains how paganism magnified himself to the prince of the host. Daniel 8, 11, and which that verse reads, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, 
and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. What is it that takes away the daily? Is it not the abomination which maketh desolate? So it's interesting that this in Daniel 8.11 is showing not only the pagan power, but also the papal power. So this system of legalism and false education produced the mindset in both the Romans and the Jews that caused Christ to be crucified. This history was repeated during the Dark Ages and will be repeated in our time for the same reasons, again resulting in the martyrdom of God's people. Now, the next section, quoting Miller's rules, rule number one, every word must have its proper bearing to the subject presented. When we apply Miller's rule number one to Daniel 11, it can be seen that the chapter is divided into several blocks of texts, so to speak, with each block centering around a principal subject. Verse 1 gives us the starting point that Gabriel selects for his narrative to Daniel. The subject of verse 2 is Media Persia. The subject of verses 3 through 14a is the kingdom of Greece. And the subject of verses 14b to 30 is the kingdom of pagan Rome. <laughs> Another transition of power occurs in verse 31. Brother Dwight. Yes, sir. Um, that rule you just read off, did, did, did he quote the whole thing? No. Well, it said, the thing says, how do you, it goes, the sweet rules that every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Right? Correct. Why did he put a two? Well, hang on. Let's deal with this. He said to the subject. He didn't say it, it, it right? Right. But the, but the, I think the original one said every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Okay. Give me a moment. Okay. Okay. William Miller's Rules of Bible Interpretation. Rule number one. Every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. So you're correct. The change that this author is making is instead of having this on the subject, he's changing a word from on to the word to the subject presented. Does that affect our understanding of this rule? Does that have impact for what we're talking about right now? I still get his point. It's still quite similar. Um, I would have preferred if he had said on, going by what William Miller said. But right. I don't know if it makes that big a difference. All right. Now, <clears throat> the other point that I'm looking at when we're dealing with Daniel 11, especially Daniel 11, 14, he's making a division of that verse where he is stating that the first portion of the verse, which reads, and in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south as being 14a and stating that that is in relation to Greece. <clears throat> and he's stating that the other portion of the verse, reading, also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fail. That this is regarding Rome. It should not be fall. As in, shouldn't the entire verse be that of Rome? Uh, you said fail. Should it not be fall? Just a minute. But they shall fall. Yes, you're correct. So also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. You are correct. I should not have said fail. But should we be dividing the verse where part of it is related to Greece and part of it is related to Rome? Would we agree with this application? So in other words, in this application, when we're looking at verse 13 stating, 
for the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a greater a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches the statement is being made that that verse 1113 is in relation to greece but that 1115 so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand, that that has to do strictly with Rome. Now, his next comment is that another transition of power occurs in verse 31, thus introducing an additional block of text, which requires us to identify the new principal subject. Does verse 31 reading, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Is this introducing a new power? Is this showing a transition? Well, I think we had verse 30 to 31 being connected to uh, paganism, people, pagan Rome. Okay. Transis transitioning into people Rome. So in a sense, there is a new power sort of being brought in in the sense that uh, people Rome replacing pagan Rome. All right. Identifying these principal subjects of the different blocks of texts allows us to also identify the overriding subject of the entire chapter. It will be seen as we progress in this study that Daniel 11 deals in a literal way with the three great persecuting powers of God's people, paganism, papalism, and spiritualism. These are identical with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Would we agree with this statement? Well, we understand there's a literal aspect up until about verse 40. Right. So you then, or even, yeah, so we're, we're sort of sort of taking a spiritual application, certainly from that there, but even, you maybe even go back, because no, we normally identify spiritual applications after the cross. So uh, we know there's verses then applying after that time. Right. And uh, so I wouldn't. It depends where he's sort of drawing the line. Sorry, who is this the author? Excuse me? Who, who is it that's uh, the writer of this paper? He is, he is one that has been studying and been part of the movement. And I have been trying to make sense of a lot of the things that, that he has written here. I'm not having an easy time to make sense of some of the things. Some of it I can agree with. Some of it in these articles, I'm not in agreement with, but I'm also, right, okay. I, I'm very willing to admit that I can be wrong. Is there like a summary you can give us of some of the things he's saying, which you're not agreeing with? Generally, where, where does this direction is? What he's sort of coming, where he's kind of aiming at? Okay. So <clears throat> one of the comments from the chat was, again, on the use of to or on, where to is a preposition to describe the direction of movement toward a destination, or on as a preposition to describe the position. Now, as the author is stating, he is seeing that papalism, paganism, and spiritualism are the same as the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. His next statement is the first thing to establish then in the study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45 is the principal subject of these verses. There Brother, are, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to have to bring up this trick to you too again, but um, does that change the meaning of that? Um, oh, said, does it change, does it change its meaning? Does it, does it change the meaning of the verse or the rule? The rule. Does it, does it change the meaning of the rule? 
I don't believe that it gives a, a huge change, but it is not a proper quote. Oh, oh, thank you. I just have a problem with people changing words I read. I don't know. <laughs> well, here again, and I, <clears throat> I will agree with a comment from the chat that somewhat it does make a change. But I find it interesting because we've spent a good amount of time addressing Uriah Smith's desire to change the the verse using instead of the king to a king, right? Right. So every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented means that that bearing is to be upon the entirety of what's being presented, not toward the subject. Now, while this can be a bit of splitting hairs, there is a refinement that every word must have its proper bearing on the subject, and that nuance is lost when we are attempting to say, every word must have its proper bearing to the subject. Now, the author continues, there are four possible candidates that a new power is introduced in verse 31. Then we have the king of verse 36, the king of the south in verse 40, and the king of the north also found in verse 40. The transition to a new power is prior to the reference regarding the king in verse 36. And there is no succeeding change of power between the abomination which maketh desolate in verse 31 and the king that does according to its will in verse 36. Now here, the verse does not read its will. It is his will. Whatever this abomination power represents, it is the same power represented by the king of verse 36. In other words, the king is not a king. The king has reference to the new power introduced in verse 31, that of the abomination that maketh desolate. Would we agree with that? Now, the kings of the south and the north draw their bearing from the king of verse 36. And as such, neither the king of the south nor the king of the north can be the principal subject. This is a statement I, I'm, I'm not really comfortable with. The next step would be to determine the true identity of this king of verse 36 and its relation to the new power of verse 31. So I'm not... Again, I'm not comfortable. Is it possible that there are two different powers here? Yes. Is it possible that it is paganism ceding the role to papalism? In other words, the daily giving way to the abomination which maketh desolate. Is there another way of looking at this? Now, the quotation that is used here states, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily and they shall place the abomination which maketh desolate. Is this a correct quotation of scripture? I ask the question very, very directly because I would have to disagree with this quotation. While it's what we've come to understand, the way the King James is written the word sacrifice, which is in italics, has been deleted. Now, whenever I, whenever I have had to make a presentation dealing with a verse such as this, I have included the word sacrifice in italics, but I strike it through. Something is removed in order to place something else. This is not just an announcement of the removal of the fourth kingdom and the placement of the fifth, but it also represents a major shift in the operating strategy of Satan. Have we at any point seen a fifth kingdom? 
is a fifth kingdom represented on either the 1843 or the 1850 charts? No, oh, papacy could be the fifth. But is this something that was being addressed? I mean, granted, whether we're when we're looking at this, we have Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. Yeah, it'd be four. And four. papacy would just be a papacy would be just be the phase of pagan Rome. Right. Different different phase, that's all. I don't see five, no. All right. So the next quotation that is being given here, Daniel twelve eleven. Go back to that. Just a moment. I jumped too far ahead. So Daniel twelve eleven. Here again, if we're quoting it, the quote should read, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, the removal of one word may make sense to some, but if we're going to quote, we need to be, you know, fairly, fairly direct. And from the chat, Ellen White calls the papacy the Romish church. Now, this transition of power from the daily to the abomination that maketh desolate, is this setting up a different kingdom? Is this a, a different group altogether? Okay, comment in the chat. One little word changes the whole meaning. For example, what if an arm shall stand on his part, and they that pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the or a daily sacrifice, and they shall place the or an abomination that maketh desolate. So I'm, you know, I'm in agreement with what's being said there. One change of one word can make a huge difference. But in this with what we're using with the King James, we're not here to change words. This is one of the one of the points that Smith made to his detriment. Right. And I'm just kind of using the example to express how important it is, even in the title or the Miller's rule. Right. Yeah. Now, the author continues... This text gives us a corresponding prophetic time period that helps us to identify the abomination that maketh desolate. It is the time period of the 1,290 days or years that tell us the length of time that this power rules. Daniel 12, 11 to 12 gives us the time span of the removal of paganism and the setting up of papalism. 508 to 538 AD, a time span of 30 years, leaving a remainder of 1,260 years, giving us the length in years of the papal rule, which brings us down to the year 1798. <clears throat> I don't have an issue with this paragraph. This is something I think that's clearly understood, but the way in which the author is leading us to come to this seems to be a very difficult route to take. And that's just my opinion. Now, <clears throat> the next statement is that he is stating, he is presenting that the 1260 years lines up with the many days of Daniel 1133 the time of the end and the time appointed at verse 35 till the indignation be accomplished of verse 36 and at the time of the end of verse 40. Any comment on this sentence and this statement? When considering this in the overall scheme of the succession of kingdoms as outlined in Daniel, this particular move from paganism to papalism is the key transition in the entire chapter of Daniel 11. This move on the part of Satan changes the nature of the persecuting power from the physical realm to the mental realm. 
is it proper to look at this as being changed from a physical realm to the mental realm? Would it be better to say that it changes this persecuting, the nature of the persecuting power from the literal to the spiritual? That would make more sense to me. Thank you. This one thing is the dividing line that governs the application of the precedent that is usually set regarding the kings of the north and the south of verse 40. Up until this fifth kingdom of the papacy, the kings of the north and the south are determined by the literal geographic land that occupy relative to Israel. But this transition now takes the king of the north and the south into the mental slash spiritual realm. This gives credence to what we were just saying. If he was to be more direct, speaking of literal and spiritual rather than physical and mental, it makes it a clearer statement. This is not to say spiritual as in allegorical or in type or figurative, but spiritual as in religious versus secular. The prophecy remains literal. In this, in this one point, the author is tacitly in agreement with Uriah Smith that Daniel 11 is a literal prophecy. Now, my, my own opinion is that prophecy is literally fulfilled, but I don't know that this is a literal prophecy because there's been a lot of figures and a lot of spiritual aspects that have been being shown throughout this entire chapter. In other words, the persecuting power is moving from the male aspect of military might as manifested in earthly kingdoms to that of the church as portrayed by a woman. It has not lost the civil, but now includes the moral. And this twofold combination is the very nature of the papacy itself. It is a marriage of paganism and Christianity, an amalgamation. And as such, it maintains two distinct personas, the civil and the moral. The same principle holds true concerning the identity of the king of the south and the king of the north, as they correspondingly operate in two distinct realms, one in the civil and the other in the moral. Any thought on that? I don't know if this this totally makes sense or not, but I'm thinking about uh, your question. Um, so in the Bible, God doesn't give a literal description of a prophecy that I can, like, directly, word for word, literally describing something in the future. Well, he does. I don't know, but in Daniel, it's it's not, <clears throat> he's not, even Daniel didn't understand some of the things, right? He he fainted because of the, right. what he thought it was, yeah. Well, so, anyway, yeah. To, to give credence with what, what you just said, I can think of one prophecy that was quite literal. That being when God spoke to Noah that the days of man shall be 120 years. Noah was, was 480 at the time that this was given, and he was 6 Hundred when he entered the ark, six hundred and one when he was on the ark. So the point there being that it was told to Noah, mankind has one hundred and twenty years in which to live. To live before the flood, you mean comes? Yes, I do. I do mean that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, here is. Here's the situation with the book of Daniel. Am I seeing this as a literal prophecy as we see in the book of Genesis prior to the flood regarding the 120 years? 
Yeah, no, I no. Uh, I mean, then we'd have then we would take twelve hundred and ninety days and the thirteen thirty five days as literal days, which unfortunately people are doing now. Right. So now the point is is attempted to be made that John agrees with Daniel. The same transition of power is seen in the description of paganism in Revelation 12, which then gives its power, seat, and great authority to papalism in chapter 13. Papalism, in turn, gives its power to another entity, that of apostate Protestantism, Spiritualism USA, making up the image to the beast. This transfer of power from papalism to Protestantism is seen in Daniel 11.38, but in his estate. This point will become very clear as we progress in our study. Now, in prior paragraphs, the attempt was made to continue to link the USA as the false prophet, for which I'm, I'm not disagreeing. But here, the false prophet is now being linked as that of apostate Protestantism, spiritualism, and the USA. I'm not totally seeing this. Now, if I'm wrong, help me understand why. Well, ain't it two forms? Republicanism and uh, Protestantism. Right. So the United States would be the Republican and a, a Protestant would be the Protestant churches, right? I would I would give credence to that, yes. I would agree. Because that um, does, that makes up a two horned power. Go ahead, please. I, I I couldn't I don't know, I have trouble with saying that paganism gives its power, seat and great authority to papalism. I in Revelation. Uh, I don't see that. I see it as uh apostate Protestantism is not paganism. Spiritualism no. is a religion. And, well, yeah, so I don't see paganism. In a sense, it's pagan religion, but spiritualism, but it's still a religion. Okay. This understanding of the transfer of power from paganism to papalism and then to the USA via apostate Protestantism brings its own distinct clarity to the seven kings of Revelation 17.10 allowing us to see the same succession of kingdoms outlined in Daniel 2, in this case showing the removal of the fourth kingdom, pagan Rome, and the setting up of the fifth kingdom, papal Rome. The authors return to this premise of it being five kingdoms. I don't know that it's it, it's completely solid. What are your thoughts? Now, here is that is that is that um I'm a little confused there uh daniel eleven thirty eight the transfer of power from papalism to protestantism right in daniel eleven thirty eight so w remind me what that that is about it, but in his estate don't really understand it. okay. I'll go to the verse right now. Now, <clears throat> before Daniel 11.38, we have Daniel 11.36 and 37. So we will read all three. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and mightily, or excuse me, and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak marvelous things against the god of God and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall mightily, or he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. So 
the author's premise here is that <clears throat> pagan Rome gives way to papal Rome, which we would agree. But the premise yeah. is this is a fifth kingdom. In subject matter, it is not that different from what Uriah Smith had had to say. Because Smith <clears throat> looks at some of this as being related to Islam. Uh, that's coloring his interpretation. Is it? Well, if he's relating it, if he's relating it to Islam, it would color the, give a different shade to the whole interpretation. I think. What, I'm, what I'm saying is that Smith did this. Right. Um, perhaps my, <clears throat> perhaps my mic's not working too good. I, I did say, yeah. Well, that color is his, meaning Smith's. Okay. Interpretation differently, yeah. Your your mic was fine. My understanding was faulty. I thought your his was referring to that of the author of this paper. Okay. Remind me who the author is of this paper. Uh, wasn't here at the start. Okay. I've, I've kept his name completely out of this. It's a, this is a brother that's been involved in the movement and has posted these studies online. Okay, no no worries then. Well, if it's online. Anyway, so, we'll refer to him as the author. The author. <clears throat> now. Maybe, maybe I can add some more. Sure. Okay. If we go through the kingdoms of kingdoms, we got Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Papal Rome, and United States, UN in the eighth kingdom, which is which is modern Rome, I reckon I say it that one. But so wouldn't that make the papal papal Rome the fifth kingdom? You would be correct in in that premise, yes. But does that give us is this supportive of what we came to understand about Revelation seventeen ten? I have to look at it again. I looked at it. Okay. Now here I'm I'm going to segue to some of the other things that we, we have seen presented and studied in the past. Revelation seventeen ten. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh he must continue a short space. So in this, if I've understood the writings of the pioneers correctly, these seven kings are being placed where five have fallen and then one is, and the other is not yet come. Now, have the pioneers in the past and Elder Jeff Place the one is as being the United States. Yes, he has. So thereby, if we are saying this, then as we have looked at this from Daniel, there would be five kings, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome in its two phases. One is being the United States, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. <clears throat> so the next paragraph, the five kings that are fallen are Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, and Papal Rome. The sixth king, the one in place at present, we know to be the United States of America, which is inclusive of the image of the beast, apostate Protestantism. The context of Daniel 1131 is dealing with the time period of the transition from, Pagel, from pagan Rome to papal Rome, from the fourth to the fifth kingdom. Okay. Uh, question, I guess. Go ahead. Is the image of the beast Protestantism or the political 
politis, politicization of religion by the United States uh, government? Good question. Good point. Well, well didn't uh, the did churches, the Protestant churches fail in um, 1842, I think you were going to. Correct. <clears throat> So and then in nine in nine in uh in nine eleven the Republican horn fell, right? The progressive fall. Correct. Isn't the image to the beast formed when the religious amendment is made? That's how I understand it. Right? I don't know that that an amendment is going to form that image to the beast I think the image to the beast is already formed but there again that's my opinion okay something to look at to discuss I guess okay so this transition is confirmed in 2 Thessalonians 2 3 to 10 as an eyewitness of pagan Rome as the fourth kingdom Paul informs the church that this power pagan Rome will yet be removed to make way for the mystery of iniquity. This mystery of iniquity is no less than papal Rome. And here references are given to Great Controversy 446.1, 356.1, and Acts of the Apostles 265 to 266. Dwight, is this author, is he saying both of is both... Is Christ sanctuary and paganism? I don't understand your question, brother. Well, if he if he's saying that it's a sanctuary, it's Christ, it's paganism, uh, the daily, and then he comes back and says that the that that part that since you just wrote ain't that ain't that saying it is paganism? Well, what he what he's been trying to accomplish here is to establish the understanding of the that the daily is paganism which has been rejected by the majority of the scholars in the church okay all right all right i had, i just was confused there for a minute all right i apologize no no don't apologize i mean this this whole thing is for for study and comment now he reaches this this portion and calls it a conclusion. One of the primary functions of the book of Daniel is to show the succession of kingdoms that, in a special way, are persecutors of God's people. Up until verse 31, the main kingdoms of paganism have been outlined in their order. Gabriel starts with Medio Persia since the fall of Babylon had already occurred. Greece is next, then pagan Rome. These four kingdoms form the sum of the persecuting powers of paganism. Verse 31 details the transition from the pagan to the papal form of persecution. In one sense, this is simply following in the same line of succeeding kingdoms as outlined in Daniel's chap- Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, and 9. As we've already noted, This transition is extremely significant as paganism hands its characteristics to papalism. The persecuting power now moves away from the secular realm and enters into the spiritual. It is the mingling of the unholy seed with the holy seed. This mingling produces two distinct lines of fathers. Its pagan lineage and its Christian lineage. This is the point where the woman or the church becomes involved as a persecuting power. And this is where, in type, Samson's lion changes forms and becomes sweet in the form of honey. Now, this is a reference back to a prior study that this author had done regarding that portion of the book of Judges dealing with Samson. Now, okay, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop what I'm reading here, and I'm going to read what's in the chat. If before publishing Elder Jones' article concerning the image of the beast, Elder Smith had conferred with him, 
plainly stating that his own views differed from that of Brother Jones, and that if the article appeared in the review, he himself must present the opposite position, then the matter would appear in a different light than what it now does. But the course pursued, hang on, but the course pursued in this case was the same as that taken at Minneapolis. Those who opposed Brethren Jones and Wagner manifested no disposition to meet them like brethren, and with the Bible in one hand consider prayerfully and in a Christ-like spirit, the points of difference. There is the only course, this is the only course that would meet the approval of God. And his rebuke was upon those who would not do this. Eight, letter manuscript, letter 77, 1893, paragraph 14, and paragraph 15. Several times during our conversation, which you became very much in earnest, you repeated the sentence, O consistency, thou art a jewel. I repeat the same with decided force to you. You say that Annie's vision place the forming of the image of the beast after probation closes. This is not so. You claim to believe the testimonies. Let them set you right on this point. The Lord has shown me clearly that the mark of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God, by which their eternal destiny will be decided. Your position is such a jumble of inconsistencies that but few will be deceived. Six letters and manuscripts, letter 11, 1890, paragraph 10. This one argument alone, the daily is paganism, is sufficient to show that the fifth kingdom, that of the papacy, is the king of verse 36. It is interesting to note that the old view of the daily comes to us as a result of Miller's rules. And as we progress, we will make a direct, more direct application of these rules in order to establish beyond question the identity of the king of verse 36. This will give us the bearing we need in order to arrive at the correct position of the kings of the south and the north. In our next article, we will be taking a look at Uriah Smith's position who contend that the king of verse 36 is France. His book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, has the endorsement of Ellen White, and because of that endorsement, many in Adventism hold to his interpretation. As we look, the intent is not to simply respond to his position and to move on, but to show how he got there, and perhaps more importantly, to reconcile the inconsistency of that view with the clear endorsement of his book by Mrs. White. It can be demonstrated that as the Jews were not given the present truth for the Millerite time period, neither were the Millerite pioneers given the present truth for our time period. This principle is found in Luke 4, 16 to 30, and shows that for each generation, Christ opens the book and then closes the book. Now, okay. Yeah, I'm a little uh, uncertain about that. The quote, there that I sent. He's saying he's saying that Jones was in error on his interpretation. I think. I'm, if I'm understanding things, there were times that Mrs. White did have to suggest to Elder Jones that he was being a little too insistent. The letter's also 1893. Isn't that after Jones apostatized? No. Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions at this time? As you had uh, previously mentioned concerning Revelation 13, or sorry, Revelation 17. Yes. Um, with uh, seven kings, five are fallen. You related that in Jeff Perminger's view, which was I 
would agree with. We also made it mention of a, a pioneer's view as well. Right. And uh, I don't think I don't think it was a, a pioneer view. Okay, then I stand corrected. Thank you. Yeah, most definitely this was this was the view of Elder Pippinger. I love these studies. Well, you know, in in a situation like this, I had been asked to look these articles over. Did I agree? Did I disagree? And there were certain things that that I'm seeing that I don't feel are presented as as well as they could be. And there are some points that I can I can fully agree with, and there's some points that I have to disagree with. Well, like as William pointed out, just that one word to or on does show uh, a degree of a lack of uh, careful scholarship. Okay. I could agree with that. It it kind of uh, brings into question a lot, a lot of the little details, perhaps. Right. Could you just maybe summarize just where he differed from your understanding in this point, please? Well, as we as we begin to look at this, I recognize that the author is treading carefully because there are many within the church, within the movement, that are taking the position that thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, because of the endorsement by Mrs. White, that everything that he has there is correct. Now, as we've studied over the last several weeks, I don't think that we're in in that type of a mindset. I am aware of several that believe that Uriah Smith should be accounted as a prophet. And with that, I'm in in total disagreement. Amen. Now, the positions in this part of the article regarding, as he states, the old view of the daily versus the new view, I think are are well borne by Hiram Edson's articles in 1856. Because his, his articles are very expository, especially about how the prophecy of Isaiah 7 is related to this understanding going from 723 BC to 1798. I can see that that this author is trying hard to place some applications that are relevant with him, but are a little harder to truly explain. So he is relating the daily just to pagan Rome. Is that correct? That is correct. I mean, our, right, okay. And then he takes verse 14 onwards to verse 30 to be in pagan Rome as well, rather than having a Greece being in verse uh, 15, and then pagan Rome coming in in verse 16. So that would be another difference. And then he makes the uh, application that the, that the beast of Revelation chapter 8, I think it is, or maybe it's chapter 7, where it talks about nails of, something about nails of iron, is that? Is that? Right. So he's uh, making that as an application that it's Greece or something? Correct. Okay, so that would be differences maybe from what our understanding would be. So is there other things there as well? Okay. So we're going to look at his next article on Sunday. As I understand it, theater will be back on Tuesday. But we're going to look at, at this because the subsequent articles have some things in it that may be of use. We're just going we're just going to have to look at this and consider this. So at this point our time is up. So shall we close our meeting today in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, as we separate and go about our days, help us to consider some of these points that have been made. Direct us now, Father, so that which is done today may be to your glory. 
We pray, Father, that you will keep Theodore safe. Help him to carefully consider that which is on his mind. Be with us now, each one, as we go through our days. And help us so that what we do may be done to your glory. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.